Here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss building a future state data architecture plan, where to begin, sponsored today by Datastax. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategy. And we very much encourage you to chat with us or with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar or follow Donna further, you may do so at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn the webinar over to Louisa from Datastax for a word from our sponsor. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for the intro. I just want to check to make sure you can see my screen okay. It looks great. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, hi, everyone. As Shannon mentioned, my name is Louise Westaby, and I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Datastax. As the title of the webinar suggests, I'm here to talk to you about building a future state data architecture plan. And I think the question really is where to begin, right? So before we talk about that, let's quickly discuss how we evolve. I know a history lesson can be a bit boring, but I will definitely make it quick here. Uh, the initial foundation for data architecture was the mainframe. So while several mainframe manufacturers produced mainframe computers, Computers for commercial use, starting about the late 1950s, they didn't really take hold until the late 70s and 80s. And this was in large part due to the introduction of a relational database. In the 90s, we then saw the introduction of the client server model, which was really a distributed application structure that supported new things like email and what we used to refer to at the time as the World Wide Web. And of course, now it's all about cloud. But what does this mean for your data? architecture. Let's take a look at an example. So here's an example of a data architecture of a big retailer, one of our customers actually. As you can see, the volumes and types of data that must be shared across different parts of the business have changed significantly over the last 20 years. So for example, think about personalization, one of the workloads up here. How data is leveraged to provide a truly personalized experience to customers based on their prior purchases, as well as things like current inventory and search history, you can just imagine the amount of data that's involved in doing things like that. And this is a huge change from the separate point of sale and inventory management applications that we had until recently. Those systems of engagement, and of the record, um, they used to run just fine on our, our mainframes and relational databases. Now, let me, let's talk about your own data architect. Can your legacy systems keep up with the needs of your business? Are they built on mainframes and are they architected for relational databases? And what about the cloud? Do you have a clear path to modernize your infrastructure? The reality is that modern applications we are now using require modern data management. Of course, the foundation for that is modern database. That's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So because of changing customer and consumer expectations, that database is required to be always on, so no downtime. It needs to be distributed across multiple geographies and maybe even multiple cloud service providers. And it also needs to provide data in real time. And that's why database architecture matters when it comes to modernizing data management. It really is the customer expectations have changed dramatically. We need databases that are always available and can quickly scale based on demand, no matter how big that demand is. We also need databases with no single points of failure, with data rotation fault tolerance, and things like global data distribution. And of course, with cloud comes a lot more options when it comes to deploying your applications. So it's also important to have the flexibility to deploy your applications and the database they are running on where you need them, whether it's on-premises, or, of course, across multiple cloud service providers. Think about a hybrid cloud model, for example. And finally, how you database can have a big impact on your budget. So, compatibility becomes a big factor, especially when we're talking about the cloud. 
So these design principles are why a new generation of databases have emerged, whether you refer to them as NoSQL, distributed, non-relational, or by some other term, they are all built with modern businesses and modern applications in mind. So Apache Cassandra was designed to address all of these architectural considerations. In case you're not familiar with it, uh, Cassandra is an open source project. It was built by Facebook to power Facebook's inbox search feature, and it's therefore architected for linear stability, for fault tolerance, and to run on commodity hardware in a cloud infrastructure. DataStax, the company I'm here representing today, we are the number one contributor to Cassandra. We've actually contributed more than 70% of the code commits to date. All of our products are developed and updated from the Open Source Cassandra project. And what that really means is that we're able to provide our users with the number one database for scale, uptime, and performance, and really building that future database. So going back to the theme of this webinar about designing a future state data architecture and where to begin, I think that Cassandra is a great place to start. It enables you to build it right, build it once, and then scale as your business scales. And that's because it's masterless, or you may think of it as peerless. It's a really a ring architecture that ensures continuous availability across multiple zones and regions with, measure, with latency that we actually measure in milliseconds. So you no longer have to watch that spinning dial as you wait for the to load. Now, because there's no master-slave relationship in Cassandra, there's no single point of failure. So to ensure that data is available even like if a node fails or are unreachable, Cassandra data is automatically replic replicated across multiple nodes and even across multiple cloud service providers to ensure constant data access. And again, that's a no single point of failure. So when we're talking about high availability, we're talking about withstanding the failure of an entire data center. That's really critical in today's modern business environment. And this is why more than 60% of DataStax's customers are deployed in the public cloud. Um, this is actually a data point from last early this year. I would expect it to be higher now. And this masterless architecture is also what allows the database to scale linearly without compromising the performance. So whether you're talking about five nodes or a thousand nodes, that all scales linearly with predictable performance. DataStax also goes beyond core Cassandra to provide support for mobile workloads, and all of this is supported under one unified security model. So, for example, we have a native graph database, um, and those capabilities really enable you to identify and analyze those hidden relationships between connected data. The Spark analytic capabilities provide real-time analytics. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Spark model. And then we also provide enterprise search functionality as well as an in-memory engine for cloud performance. You can dig into more details about our data management capabilities on our website, of course. So now let's talk about what this means with a real-world example. So let's take a talk about Macy's. Macy's needed a flawless data management platform to power its omnichannel catalog, especially during the holiday business, busy holiday season. So you can imagine right now there's a lot of stress on their systems and their data management platform. And what this meant to Macy's is that in order to stay competitive, they really needed to provide a positive engaging, and engaging customer experience across all their channels in order to attract and retain customers both online and in the store. So to accomplish this, Macy's adopted a multi-cloud strategy. They did that with IBM initially and it leveraged data stacks for its omnichannel catalog service. The result of all that was the API for Macy's the omnichannel catalog now scales up to millions of universal product codes and a million requests per second with a million, millisecond response time. Lots of millions in there, so you get it, right? It's a big, big deal. We were also able to support Macy's in providing a seamless online and mobile customer experience, both on-premises and across their multi-cloud infrastructure. So we now, at this point, have five years with Macy's with zero downtime. It's a big deal for a big retailer like this, especially during this holiday season. Most recently, um, they did GCP or Google Cloud to their multi-cloud infrastructure. Started first with test dev and then very quickly moved to production. 
because they were already running on data stacks from a data management perspective, this was incredibly easy for them. We were actually in the room with their lead architect and drew on the board how they simply have to add the data center, change the replication factor in the schema, and then the data, data stacks database automatically begins replicating. This was something that the architect never thought was possible. There were literally jaws dropped in the room, which is really cool to see. So that's the end of my presentation. If you're interested in learning more about Cassandra or data stacks, you can do so for free on Data Stacks Academy. Uh, we have a tons of educational content available. You have to sign up. There's no obligation from a payment standpoint or anything like that, completely free. Um, and the URL there, in case you can't use the QR code, is academy.datastack.com. Thank you all for your time and attention. With that, I'm going to hand this back to Shannon. Louise, thank you so much. This is a great presentation. we got questions coming in for you. So if you have additional questions for Louise, she will be joining us in the Q&A section at the end of the presentation today. Um, but let me turn it over now to to Donna Burbank. She is a recognized in industry expert on in information management with over 20 years of experience, helping organizations enrich their business opportunities throughout data and information. She is currently the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, I will turn it over to our series speaker, Donna Burbank, to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hello there. Always a pleasure to join you guys. Um, and this should be a good session wrapping it up for the year. Uh, for those of you who have joined in the past, thank you. Um, and the question that always comes up in the Q&A is, are these uh, recorded? And yes, they are. So if this is your first time joining us or you missed any of the other ones throughout the year, uh, these are all available uh, on dataversity.net uh, in perpetuity, I, I believe. So um, do try to catch some of the other ones you might have missed. Also, in sort of the theme of this uh, webinar is sort of planning ahead for next year. So on that note, we do have a full lineup for next year. We also are continuing this series. Um, so just to start to plan your calendars um, uh, ahead for some of the topics we'll be covering, including things like cloud-based data warehousing, uh, which fits into uh, what Louise was just talking about. So do try to catch us again uh, next year if you're able. Um, so, delving right into the topic, uh, what we're going to cover today is actually based on a report uh, survey we did, or I did, uh, with a Data Diversity earlier this year um, on trends in data management. And hopefully you'll find this interesting, not only on talking about some of the trends, um, but it's always nice to have actual data <laughs> and metrics uh, behind this. So I think you'll find it interesting. I certainly did. Um, if you are interested in seeing the actual live survey itself, uh, it's two places, so it is out on the Dataversity website, of course, um, and we also have it on the Global Data Strategy website under our white paper section. So either of those places, you can go get a copy of this um, and see the actual report yourself. So what we were trying to understand in this report and what we'll also cover in this webinar, um, for, for firstly, is you know how do we even define data management, right? We're an industry that loves to have, you know, we work on definitions and we love to try to argue about what definitions of things mean. So we're sort of the cobbler's children uh, have no shoes. Uh, we're often bad at kind of defining these terms. But I'd like to just kind of start with what we even mean by data management in today's new environment. What are the hot technologies to adopt and, and what's a passing fad or a trend? And I, it can be very confusing in the market. There are so many um, options out there, and as Louise mentioned, you know, in the 70s, maybe it was easy. We had mainframe or, you have know, mainframe, right? So, but now, I mean, it's just amazing. It's a great time to be in data management, but it can be overwhelming as well. Um, so not only just kind of tools and technologies, which tend to be fatty and trendy, um, but how can we actually start to build the actual data architecture to support my business goals and what, why are we doing this and how do we make this a bit sticky so it isn't just, you know, the tool of the hour, um, but a data architecture that can grow with my business. So uh, hopefully you'll find this interesting as we go through some of the findings um, and, and, and the report. So, Again, if we want to start with a definition of data management, what better place to go than the data, uh, DEMA, DMBOK, or the uh, data management body of knowledge. And if you look at their definition, I, I like it in a way in that it covers sort of a lot of the areas we're, we're thinking about. It's not only how you deliver uh, data management, what kind of platforms, how you also control and protect it, uh, but then the idea of how do we enhance it? How do we actually use data and information assets to help our business um, 
drive. And they were trying to do this for a reason. So that's sort of the textbook or the DM Buck book <laughs> definition of data management. What I also thought was interesting um, in the survey, and, and hopefully we'll be doing these yearly and, and you'll have a chance to chime in yourself on future reports, uh, but we take a, a look at the comments as well. And there's always some great uh, input from survey respondents. So I took some of the answers that people sort of typed in I thought they were um, very interesting. So a lot of folks sort of touched on the idea that, yes, data management sort of by its you know, title is data and technology, but really it's the people in the process of, um, in technology as well. Uh, the second one there you'll talk about organization capability, that, yes, it's supported by tools, um, but it's also processes, standards, and importantly, people. And we'll talk more about that in this session. Um, and the last one I like, because it sort of touches on what you, know, you mentioned earlier, is that data management, the value of it is making your data effective so that you can actually support your business activities. And I, I think data is fun. I think a lot of people on the call think it's fun, um, but we're not doing this for fun. We're doing this for a reason uh, to actually help the business and the organization. Which leads us uh, to the framework that we use at Global Data Strategy, um, and as our name implies, we do data strategies globally. So uh, we sort of do this for a living, literally. And, and what we always start with is just what I mentioned, is how does data support your business strategy? If you, if you don't get that right, it's not worth doing anything else. A lot of things we could do. We all have other things that we'd like to do in our lives as well. So let's focus on the highest value activities and really understanding how you can use data to really enhance your business. So many companies I'm working with now are, are actually using the tagline that you know, we're a data driven business. Can we be the next Uber? Can we be the next Facebook? Can we be the next thing, company that we haven't thought of that can leverage data in, in, in a unique way? And if you're the type of, of data person that uh, you know, wears a lot of different hats and it kind of has a, has a business slant or a penchant for data, uh, this is a great time to be in data because you know that, that sort of gear up at the top that has alignment um, really shows that it's bi-directional. It isn't always just the business saying, you know, oh, data people go do this. Um, often it's data people coming to the business saying, hey, we could do this, um, just basically looking at the data. So I think that's some of the great opportunity um, that's out there. And when we talk about things like cloud, you know, per Louise's conversation, the, the amount, I'm going to try to say a word I can't pronounce, <laughs> democratization of data um, really gives a lot of opportunity um, to anybody out there with a you know who can actually access a massive amount of data and a lot of the great technology out there uh, to actually do some great uh, things uh, with technology. So we look from the top down at the business, but then we also need to look bottom up if you look down at that level five of you know what are we using in the organization and maybe more excitingly, what could we use? And we'll talk about that in terms of the platform opportunity that is out there, uh, your on premises or in the cloud. So are, are we using all mainframe? Um, and we can scoff at mainframe, but there's a whole bunch of it out there that's still working pretty well. <laughs> so someone did a good job way back in the day. Uh, that said, I don't see too many new implementations of you know starting out fresh looking at mainframe. So what are the different opportunities? Does what we have as an organization align with our business goals, and how do we get there? And you know. Anything is, is possible, right? I, you know, you, anyone can run a marathon. You may never have run before, but you can do the training to get there. So, you know, we've worked with organizations. We had one company that wanted to be a completely digital, completely online company, and they literally, I didn't think these companies existed, um, but literally were using paper uh, processes, and they sort of had the invoicing um, lady who would kind of carry the paper over to another desk, right? <laughs> didn't mean they can't get there, and they did, but it really you have to take that realistic look of what are we using for technology? and what we can do with it. And then we sort of move up the stack um, to how do we get that inventory of our data sources? How do we integrate them? Because there will be, I guarantee, disparate data sources across your organization from ERP systems to relational databases to cloud to mainframe to NoSQL, right? So how do we really get that integration in an effective way? And then how do we have the metadata management to really make that integration effective? Do we know what the data means? Do we know what the lineage of that data is, et cetera? And then moving up the stack again, how do we really make sense of that with a holistic architecture, with whether it's a data model or a data architecture, or you know, remastering the information? Is there a warehouse and or an analytics hub, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? What's the quality of data? So you know, data is complex, and it isn't all about the platform, and it's not all about the business need. It's how you put all that together in sort of the magical way with the architectural structure to have it make sense. And then as you know, folks wrote in in the definition of data management, 
Data is managed as a verb, and there has to be people doing actively doing that verb. Um, so that's where data governance comes in. It's the people and the process and the policy, and probably most importantly, the culture. And so as I mentioned, we do a lot of these in our company, uh, Global Data Strategy, and, and we do sort of maturity assessments. And we often are lucky enough to kind of grow with our customers and we'll be there several years in a row. And we like to kind of do that maturity assessment year after year. Often the fastest thing to fix is the technology. We can get a new platform in place. We can you know, get new tools. But getting the people to come along with that and have a data-driven culture where everyone understands what that means, that's often where the lag is. So governance is not something you can, can skip. Um, you'll see that that line is strategically placed between business strategy and implementation below it. That's really where that glue kind of melds together. Of we have a company that's, that's doing business processes, and we have technology, and it's the people and the processes that really make that thing. So you can't skip the government piece. It's really critical to everything we'll be talking about. So moving along into sort of the, some of the survey results and our findings, um, what I thought was interesting to kind of look at is what are you, there's a lot of pieces as that kind of framework mentioned of data management, and everyone defines data management slightly differently, but what are you using today, and then what's your vision for the future? So it wasn't surprising to me, be curious your thoughts in the chat or in the questions, but um, huge focus on business intelligence reporting data warehousing. I see those as different, the ones the reporting layer and ones the kind of, you know, the, the database layer behind it. Um, a lot, so many companies are going to be or pushing to be data driven, and a lot of that is data driven decision making of do I have the right analytics, either prescriptive or you know, descriptive or predictive, you know, depending on what level you're at, um, but really trying to use data and analytics to understand your business. So that particularly wasn't a surprise to me. It was great to see the high uh, focus on data security uh, because I think. You know, that kind of goes with privacy and governance as well. Um, what was also interesting is looking ahead, a huge jump, and this is something that we didn't expect and we hadn't seen in previous surveys, is the large shift towards sort of semantic web uh, technologies, or even if you think of sort of uh, kind of your graph database model. Um, and I think uh, Louis touched on that a little bit in the introduction of, you know, we're trying to just sort of discover hidden patterns in data or make connections between data. That sort of makes a lot of sense. Similarly, that sort of high uh, data virtualization count there, as, as people have disparate sources of information, kind of that idea of leaving data in place and creating that virtualization layer on top can be very appealing. Again, these are all tools in the toolbox. Uh, I have a lot of rants and pet peeves, and maybe some of you have been lucky enough to hear them. Uh, but it, it's one of one of them is when a vendor comes in and says, "We have data virtualization, and therefore data warehousing is gone," or "We have data warehousing now, and that means." You know, any operational reporting is gone, et cetera. So these are all valid technologies in their place, and they all are kind of tools in your toolkit, and we'll get more into that. Um, and then you'll see here the third and fourth, our, uh, fifth actually aren't, aren't a surprise either. Um, when we're looking at a lot of companies looking at analytics, that idea towards data science, AI, machine learning, big data, self-service analytics. Um, and then, of course, which is nice to hear, that when people are looking at analytics and big data, they're also thinking of metadata management and data governance because that really is – completing the picture. You could have great reports, but if you don't know what the data means or who, who created that data, they're not gonna be effective or they may even be risky to your, your business. So kind of refreshing to see that as well. Um, so what I also found interesting, and it kind of talks into the beginning of not only what people are doing, but the why. So what are your business drivers? So again, the analytics and reporting, uh, top of the list. Um, I think in, in a way that can be frustrating to some of us in the business when people think data, they think reports, they think analytics. That is one very valid use case, um, but it's not the only one. And you'll see some others there well that, uh, as well that have been probably true since the dawn of time when it comes to data. Can we use data to save costs and be more efficient? Yes. Can we use uh, data and governance to reduce risk? Yes. Can we improve customer satisfaction? I mean, a lot of these um, are common, which is great to see them, that they're kind of continuing needs. I think that idea of digital transformation um, is another one I'm seeing in our practice. It, it sort of goes along with some of that customer satisfaction. I mean, what is, what is the customer need? A lot of it's digital. How do we translate that customer journey from on-prem uh, or brick and mortar to kind of the digital uh, workspace? So what, what's refreshing to see is that people do see that data link to it. I think early in the ages of digital transformation, I know I saw in some of our customers, it was 
oh, digital means web. It means kind of the front end. I think um, as people matured, they realized really digital transformation is the data. You can't do any of it without the data. That's really the foundation of your digital transformation. So, you know, be curious your thoughts. I, I, I don't think those were surprising, but they were refreshing. I think, you know, it, it kind of parallels a lot what I'm seeing in the industry as well. Um, if we move ahead um, in terms of, you know, what we were just sort of putting statements out there. What do you think is accurate in this laundry list of things that we hear all the time in terms of data management? I think very refreshing was that do you see data as an essential asset to your business? That was you know, the spike you see there at the bottom, almost everybody. Um, and again, maybe we have a biased audience. This was a data diversity survey. You know? <laughs> but, so, of course, folks taking the survey sort of had data on the brain. Um, but it was refreshing to see that the majority of organizations really do see data as an asset. I think where it breaks down, and I see this as well in my practice, is that, yep, I know that data is an asset. I know that's important. But what does that actually mean? And how do I implement it? And, and when the rubber meets the road, how do I get that? To work is sort of where things um, are kind of lowerly ranked there. So um, some of the, the smaller bars, you know, do all stakeholders understand their part in data management? And I see that a lot as well when we're trying to implement things like data governance. Yep, data quality, need it, go fix it. Uh, well, everybody has a role in data quality if you're putting the data in or you're managing the business process that enters the data. Um, that, that's not something necessarily IT can fix or a software can fix. Uh, part of that ties into communication, you know, and that's that's communication is hard anywhere in the world, right? Where people are complicated, um, but especially when we're talking about high tech stuff like data, um, it, it sort of adds that layer of you know complexity of how do we take very technical terms and explain that in a way that everyone across the organization understands. Um, and I mentioned quality. Uh, that's continually a challenge because that's you know something that always has to be work on. Data is is a business uh, you know is a a part and parcel of the business, and the business continues to evolve. So data quality isn't something you do once and put a tool in and, and fix. It's something that needs to be managed on a daily basis. And and part of that is that last bullet is getting those metrics in place of what does good look like? What are our targets? Does everybody in the organization know what our data quality targets are? We might know our financial KPI targets. Uh, do we know our data quality KPI targets? Um, and are we all kind of marching to that same set of targets, whether we're business people and or IT people, we all should be trying to get a certain threshold for data quality for our key data assets. Um, so which kind of leads me, I've been talking a lot, um, or at least alluding to this idea that, you know, data isn't just an IT thing or a data analytics thing, it's a, it's a business thing. Um, so we asked, okay, when we're talking about data management, who is driving that? Who would say to be the leader when we're talking about data management? Some of those should not be a surprise when we have folks like the data architect leading data management. I would hope so. That is not necessarily surprising. Or data analytics or chief information officer or chief data officer. Um, I think the high uh, spike in business stakeholders I found interesting. Now, we did not – this was, uh, if you notice up top um, – looking at the data carefully, it's a select all that apply. Um, so it, is, it may make me nervous if, say, a business stakeholder was running, the only person running a data management um, issue because it is a technical thing. But by the same token, I would be nervous if only the IT manager were running that, right? So what was interesting when we looked at that other, the other sort of spike at the bottom, um, was that data governance lead was probably the most common other, which leads me to believe that normally when one puts into a, a data governance council or a steering committee or a team or group, all of those stakeholders that are listed there are involved. So this was a multiple choice. I'm hoping, and then probably a strong inclination, given that I've worked with a lot of organizations that, that do this sort of thing, it's probably a team effort, um, which is a great trend to see, that none of this should be done in a vacuum, that when you're building a data management organization, it should involve the business stakeholders and the analytics team and the CIO, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I see that as a positive trend. And, and governance sort of came up throughout the survey, sprinkled in even when we didn't ask, which is a great trend to see. Um, you know, those of us in the business for a long time are probably refreshed to see so many people finally understanding that governance is that glue that holds all of this tech and data management together. Um, so we can't forget, I've talked a lot about people and governance and process and all of that, but at the end of the day, we are putting data on a platform. And so technology is critical um, and is what a lot keeps a lot of us in the business because it's kind of fun. So when we look at that, um, 
part of this keeps me up at night and makes me twitch. Uh, the one at the bottom is that spreadsheets keeps coming up year after year as one of the leading data sources or platforms. Now, one could read this in several ways. If one is in a positive Pollyanna sort of glass half full, um, it could just mean that a lot of data business people are looking at data and what a business people look at is spreadsheets. And, and it doesn't necessarily, we did say source or platform. Um, but it could be that it could be an export, right? I, maybe I take it from the master data or the warehouse and I put it in a spreadsheet and I do stuff with it. That makes me less nervous than I am managing my master data in a spreadsheet or my, quote, warehouse <laughs> spreadsheet. Um, and I have seen all of that. I think uh, probably three or four companies we work with this year had the the Mary spreadsheet or the Joe spreadsheet or the Michael spreadsheet that really was the location master or the employee master list or, you know, seriously important data to the organization that was stored in a spreadsheet. So I hope and pray and am not encouraged that it will happen anytime soon, <laughs> but that that spreadsheet line, as we do these year over year, will kind of keep getting smaller um, because it should be a consuming mechanism or an analytic, you know, if you're doing some financials, um, great place to do that in a spreadsheet. But really a poor choice for a master data hub. Um, the other one that continues to spike um, is a relation, the relational database. It was true the past few years we've done this. Um, and you'll see that at least today, the majority are still on-premises, um, but you'll see that the other larger spike there is also kind of cloud-based relational databases. Um, and if you permit me a bit of a rant, um, <laughs> I did, it was one of the rants I already did, but when folks um, come in with a new technology, you'll see the others there, whether it's Graph or IoT or Semantic or XML or JSON. Um, it sort of means that relational databases are going away. I mean. I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think um, that the data isn't supporting that and the technology isn't supporting that. What relational databases do, they do very well. In fact, a lot of the customers I work with are using relational databases, but perhaps more like a spreadsheet. And so I think there's some untapped potential in you know, folks that don't have foreign keys or don't have you know, their normal form or some of the things that really enhance some of the data quality. Um, as folks look to automate and they automate things like governance, relational databases were kind of built around that present premise to how do we, you know, keep things consistent uh, across systems. So I don't see them going away, yet I see the ecosystem changing, which sort of leads to that next slide, um, is future, right? So you'll see, and very fewer people admit to using spreadsheets in the future, it sort of went down a little bit, um, but they're still there. Uh, but you'll see the relational still up top still a clear winner, but you'll see the trend uh, of less on-premises or equally on-premises with clouds. You'll see clouds sort of growing. Um, actually, I, I correct myself. You don't see on-premises decreasing, actually. You see it sort of being equal with clouds. So it doesn't necessarily mean one is better than the other, they, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, they both have their place. But you'll still see that that is sort of the, the, work for, the workhorse of the organization of, of relational databases. What you also see is an, a more even distribution of the technologies, which I find uh, refreshing. So if we go back to the previous slide of what people are using today, there's spikes. You have relational databases and your spreadsheets, and then people are kind of dipping their toe in the water with these other technologies, which is fine because these are new, and it's great to dip your toe before you jump into the deep end, right? Um, but what makes me heartened by this is you don't necessarily see a spike to everybody jumping on the Hadoop platform or the graph database platform because I see these as fit for purpose solutions, right? There is not a one size fit all. The great thing is that now in, in the database world, we have a Swiss Army knife, right? You don't just have to use your old stick knife or butter knife, right? Um, you have a lot of tools. And it, I read this as people are realizing that. Um, and they're using the tools in the toolkit as they see fit, um, which is probably a fairly even distribution like this, uh, like this right? So that um, Hadoop has a great use case, a Graph has a great use case, relational databases have a great use case. Use them as they were designed, um, and I think people will see much more success. So I see this as heartening, and I see this also as fun <laughs> because that's why we're in the business. I mean, the number of tools that are out there um, and the number that you can literally spin up in the cloud and just play with from your living room um, it was amazing. I was telling the story to a friend yesterday. I have a friend that works for um, NCAR in, in Boulder, Colorado, that does a lot of atmospheric research. And his dad did too. And he said, son, as fathers do, <laughs> the amount of power you have in the cloud and on your laptop, we would have killed for. And the amount of open data that's available from 
governments and, and research agencies that you can literally spin up in your living rooms stuff that we would have died for uh, and we had a big mainframe in Wyoming with a whole building that kind of did this analysis for us. Um, so it is a great time to be in data management and you have a lot of different tools in the toolkit. So I thought this was interesting. If um, you know, there's, there's probably technologies here that may be new to you and it's a great time and Dataverse is a great uh, platform to kind of learn about some of these new technologies like semantic technologies or graph databases, et cetera, because uh, there is a lot of cool and fun stuff out there. Um, uh, cloud must come up um, because that is sort of a trend coming up. So we should have asked two things. What are the pros and what are the cons? So you'll see there sort of the, the highest pro um, that people listed was better scalability. And I just talked to it that literally you can spin up a, you know, something on AWS or whatever on the cloud uh, at a very uh, inexpensive um, cost um, and get things done very quickly. Also, and I think uh, Luis mentioned the Macy's example, it, a lot of organizations have sort of seasonality of, of their demand, and so maybe you need a lot of uh, bandwidth around Christmas, and then, you know, in March, nobody's thinking about you, and so you don't necessarily want to have to buy a bunch of hardware just for that one month, et cetera. So there's a lot of flexibility there. I think the the con, well, the con that folks mentioned uh, was that idea of privacy and security, and that's heartening that people are thinking of that. I think people have to be realistic, and not all cloud providers are the same, and, and you know, clearly people are using them. It's not all risk, um, but and I'm sure you guys know this and have heard this before, but it's kind of a sometimes a nice way to think of it is, you know, the cloud isn't the cloud, it's somebody else's machine, right? So when you think of it that way, be careful what you put and make sure that there's, you know, uh, your contracts are done accordingly and um, that they have the proper um, SLAs, right? So I have had customers with cloud providers that it goes down and it's bad when your own server goes down. Uh, but at least you have some control over that. And when somebody else's go, server goes down, uh, it's a scary feeling. So anyway, those are kind of the, the uh, as reported, kind of pros and cons that people saw. What I found interesting, when you kind of put them side by side, you'll see that some of the pros were also a con. Right? You'll see what, what, what is the, the reason for moving to the cloud, lower costs, why don't you move to the cloud, higher costs. Okay, but they're both right, it really. And you need to think of your use case. And I'm actually glad this came up because it's a sort of, you know, uh, is, is it more or less expensive to rent or buy a home? There is no one answer. Everybody has a different, you know, lifestyle or, or, or financial model. Uh, there's some pros and cons to each. Um, but just think carefully. It is a different um, cost arrangement, you know, whether it's uh, uh, CapEx or OpEx is, was one big decision. Um, it is a different world. I had one client who, I mean, I mentioned it. It's so easy to spin up kind of test databases, and they were used to sort of the on-premises, I think it was SQL Server, that they were using in the, in the past and sort of moved to an on-cloud, and it would spin up these servers and then forget to shut them off. And you're still paying for that. <laughs> um, it's not like you buy the hardware and it's done. So a part of that was just educating their team and – Oh, but anyway, their, their costs ended up being incredibly higher in the cloud, and it didn't mean the cloud was bad. It was how they used the cloud. Um, it, you know, so, again, think of that carefully. There is not one answer. Um, and make sure it matches your use case. Back to that, is it cheaper to rent or buy a home? Uh, think of that for you. There's no one answer. Uh, similarly, with better or lower performance, there's different use cases. It is not all or nothing. So really do some tests. Um, on your data, think of the variability on the different platforms of, of your, you know, usage throughout the year, et cetera. So I thought that was kind of interesting that what, you know, uh, what's one person's hell is another person's heaven, right? You really think of it, it, it none of this is a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and I would be remiss if I only talked about uh, technology or I only talked about governance. After all, this is an architecture strategies webinar. Um, and what can be overwhelming is that the fact that these tools and technologies do change so rapidly. And what I find heartening is, is that there's, there are architectural principles uh, that go across all of these. So um, having a data model of your assets, and that should not change as rapidly, right? I still have customers and products um, and accounts and invoices, um, and I should be able to have at an architectural or even conceptual level a map of my data assets of the organization. As I move from these different platforms from on-prem to the cloud and I want to see how that data moves, do I have that written somewhere in a data flow diagram or system architecture diagrams? Um, and I see so few companies when we 
go together and, and kind of do some work together that there is a overarching view of that. A lot of folks have sort of detailed individual systems, but stepping back and really looking at that big picture. So I think as one looks at all of the different choices available in, in now and in the future, kind of stepping back and looking at what does my business want to do? What is the data I need? Um, and then how is my current state system architecture and data flow working? How does that affect my business process? It can be very eye-opening and really kind of help focus with all the choices it's sort of a more technical way of looking at what am I trying to do and what do I have today. So this was, again, from the survey, what people are actually using in the survey respondents. You know, highest was a logical data model, which I found interesting. And I guess the positive of that is that's a business view. And one could argue if logical is kind of based on relational and I guess sort of. But at the end of the day, um, it should be a platform agnostic business view at a fairly detailed level of your organization. Um, at a similar, I saw a conceptual model come in second. I mean, that absolutely should be platform obnoxious, <laughs> a platform agnostic um, in that it should be, this is the, these are the data assets we have in this organization. Again, we have products and patients and students and classrooms, et cetera, et cetera, um, that should be your sort of guiding uh, light or whatever, your guide as you do these different platforms of what data goes where and even having an overlay onto these platforms. So found that found that interesting and just sort of a reminder that no matter what technology platform you're using, please do have kind of that system architecture uh, view, the kind of the bird's eye view, and then the data asset view as well. So hopefully those findings were interesting. Again, if you want the full report, you uh, 40, 50 pages, so you can, you can definitely keep yourself up at night if you can't sleep. Um, there's some great findings there. But I think more interesting is, the, so what? So how do, I, how do I put this together as I head into 2020? I know a lot of you are, as we are, in, sort of in planning mode for what do we do next year? What are our priorities? So, um, again, when we have all of this technological change and options, um, <laughs> I was complaining some of the other day I travel on is, I imagine as a consultant, um, and one of the things that stressed me out that wasn't maybe rational was one of the car rental companies, you can now pick your own car. I remember one day I had quite a stressful day, and I just said, really, I have to choose one more thing. Just tell me what car I get. And sometimes I think we can all feel that way. You go to the uh, grocery store, and there's 700 versions of shampoo. Um, anyway, so sometimes we can feel that way with technology. In some ways, it was easier when there was mainframe or mainframe, right? So with 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 uh, options come responsibility. And so sometimes it's nice to have some just basic steps or templates or ways, mantras to kind of keep everything in order as we're looking at all of these disparate technologies and how they go together. So this is um, kind of a thought when we're thinking of how we do or put together a data management program. And you'll see there's a lot of people-y things here. Um, technology is clearly important, but none of that works well unless you have buy-in and support and, and a team behind you. So ab none of these needs to necessarily be followed in order. It isn't a one, two, three. Um, but you'll see that up in the upper left, uh, I would say one of the more important things is getting that senior executive support, having a data champion from the business, not necessarily IT. I would hope that the CIO or the chief data officer was supportive of data. But what about your chief marketing officer or your CEO um, or your HR, et cetera? Um, make sure everybody understands the data is an asset and what they need to do. And then align uh, what you need to do with your company's vision, and motivations, and drivers. Are you focusing all of this great data on the right things? Um, part of what you can do to do that is talk to a lot of different folks. We all get into our silos, and we all could benefit by getting out of those silos. They, took a management class once and one of the workshops we did was just find somebody in the room that you, looks completely different from you in every way. Um, and I sort of ended up the guy in the law department that, you know, really we had nothing in common, um, but we became fast friends and we were able to help each other. He knew nothing about tech. I knew very little about law. You know, when he needed tech advice, I could go, he'd come to me and, and vice versa. If I needed legal advice, I could go to him. And I, I think in your organization, think of that. We're trying to launch a marketing you know, application, have I talked with marketing? Do I understand what they need? Can marketing help me communicate about our data program, et cetera? So I think, again, a lot of us get in the silos, and if you're trying to do a business-driven data program, 
Go outside your comfort zone. Is it either across functions or maybe up and down? Um, is it someone below you in the, in the, you know, is it the data entry clerk? Have you ever talked to that person who actually puts the data in for the data quality? Have you gone up? Have you talked to the C-level team and said, well, you know, what do they understand? What are their goals around data? So that often can, can kind of help get that long-term vision. Um, build the business case of why we're doing this. Uh, look at the data that's most critical. We can do a lot of different things with data, but none of us has all the time in the world. So how do we focus that for the business drivers and then map that to your capabilities? Um, and I think also assessing your, your realistic maturity. Um, in some cases, you can do a massive scale jump from you know, where you are to some of these newer technologies. Um, uh, in some cases, you may want to take a more you know, measured approach and kind of getting your, your ducks in a row before you go too fast. A lot of folks say, for example, want to jump into artificial intelligence. Um, that's sort of increased our business a lot in areas, not in AI, but in areas like data quality and governance, because you can't do AI on bad data, right? So before you want to do some of these new technologies, make sure you're ready, and then create the right organization, whether it's governance or steering committees or data teams, et cetera, so you can really deliver those quick wins and show value continually. So you, especially with some of these cloud providers, you can do things a lot quicker, um, but you have the glossary behind it and the governance behind it and the architecture behind it to make sure that that quick win will still be winning two years from now, right? Um, and then communicate, 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 and make sure everybody is sort of understanding that vision. So and that's often one that people forget. We're so busy building stuff, we sort of forget to tell everyone about it. <laughs> and um, you know, I had to sit in marketing myself, and I think, you know, the mantras that, that was, after, you know, maybe after six times people hearing it, people might remember it once. So you have know you know you've done this great data quality cleanup or built this new platform um, in the cloud, but does everyone know about it and did they hear about it six times? Because they have other things they need to do. So make sure you can use, you know, use webinars, use lunch and learns, use email, et cetera, um, to really get that word out. And as you put together your roadmap, it can be overwhelming. Um, because there's so many things you need to do. You know you need, you need to clean up data quality. You know you probably need better governance, but if you just focused on that, uh, folks are going to say, well, where's all the analytics? Where's the cool stuff I need? Where's AI? Um, so I would say when you're looking at this, look at that business value. I know this is obvious, but sometimes just sort of writing out the obvious can be helpful. Where are we trying to get? We're trying to get an integrated customer view by the end of the first quarter. Who cares about that? Those are the people. Who do I need to market to, communicate to, get involved in the design? Marketing, sales, customer support. Ooh, I forgot about support. Of course, I'd be interested, right? Get all of your stakeholders together and then do a bit of a mix. So what you're seeing here, and hopefully in that list on the left, you're doing sort of foundational things like lineage and glossary and data design, but maybe get some open data in there. Maybe do some IoT integration. Maybe try a graph database. Maybe try – so if you, if you focus on the use case and focus on the foundation and also focus on some of the new shiny things, it's kind of a nice mix of, of getting faster to innovation, um, but also not building that innovation on a kind of a – a faulty foundation that's going to crack later. So uh, just kind of think of that to mix it up a bit. We can all kind of get it excited on either way, either over-governing and then having only architecture or over-shiny things and, and never kind of building that architecture beneath it. So try to mix it up. Um, again, as you kind of put together your roadmap and, and strategy for next year, kind of the, you know, the standard who, what, when, where, why can be really helpful. You know, why? can sometimes be the most valuable one, right? Why are we doing this anyway? If we were to pick one thing that management or the entire company could get around, what is it? Are we trying to get better customer retention this year? Are we trying to lower costs this year? Whatever, often just go to your companies, um, if, especially if you're a publicly traded, go to your annual report. What is management saying to the street that are your goals? Well, align with those. Um, are we offense? Are we trying to do growth and, and revenue or defense? Are we trying to reduce risk? Is it the California data protection? You know, are we try is it GDPR we're worried about? And then how do we have KPIs, right? And then the who. I mentioned that already. Not who could help champion it, who's going to do the work, both from the business and the IT, and then who's going to kind of own this and champion it going um, going forward. Um, how? Not only how technically, which I think we talked about, what platforms do we pick? Um, you know, how do we, is it on cloud, uh, on cloud, on premise or in the cloud, but also how do you organize the teams around things like governance to really help you roll that out? And then the what? Think about that as well. That's sort of aligned with the why. 
what are we trying to do? We're better have we're trying to have better customer retention. Well, let's maybe f- focus on customer data and maybe location of those customers, et cetera. But we can't do everything. So picking picking a small, you know, do a high level conceptual or logical enterprise model so you can see the entire scope. And then almost, you know, if you think of that as a those color by numbers, right? <laughs> think of your conceptual model of this is my empty slate. What are we going to color in in phases? We're going to start with product and customer and link those together or product and location and start filling that in over time but aligned with your business drivers and then think what's the best platform to store that in. So maybe my customer master data should be in a relational database. Maybe it should not be in a spreadsheet. We all know that. Um, but that's probably not a great place for a Hadoop platform. Or, but maybe I'm trying to get some IoT streaming data about call logs from my, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so think of what platforms align with that. And then the when. Um, so make sure when we're going to roll it out that's realistic, um, but broken up into kind of manageable chunks so that you're showing some quick wins along the way. We cleaned up customer data. Great. Look at now we have addresses and we can send out mailing campaigns. Great. We integrated everything to a warehouse. Now we have MDM. So just so keep communicating and, and develop a lot of small things quickly uh, rather than waiting for the big bang at the end. So in summary, um, as you're building a data architecture uh, for next year, make sure that um, you understand that this is sort of aligned with business insights. You know, what seems to be hot in the market today is the idea of reporting and analytics. Uh, to get there, you not only need a diverse technology landscape, um, but the, the idea of collaboration across the teams to get it. Um, and don't forget, as you are shooting for some of these new great technologies, that you still need the metadata and the data models and the architecture, as well as the governance and the people behind it. So I will open it up for questions in a moment. Um, just quickly, um, this is uh, my company, Global Data Strategy. We do this for a living if you need help. <laughs> um, remember that next year we have a, a full lineup, and, and Dataversity will be getting the word out soon of sort of how you register and if you want to uh, join us again next year. And, again, if you want the paper, there's two places to download this from, um, either Global Data Strategy or Dataversity. So, without further ado, Shannon and I will open it up for questions. Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. Great, as always. If you have questions for Donna, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session to all registrants. So, um, the first question in here is actually for uh, Luis. Uh, it's Cassandra a DAS database as a service, or do you need to host your own instance? Um, so if you're talking about uh, source Cassandra, you do need to host your own instance of that. Um, at DataStack, we do have the, I guess, call it, let's call it self-managed um, product. It's a project product called DataStack Enterprise that you would manage yourself deploying the cloud. You can also deploy it through most of the big cloud marketplaces. Um, we also do have in beta a uh, product called DataStacks Apollo, which is our new data, uh, database as a service offering. So we'll be um, hopefully in going to GA with that next year. You can try it for free at apollo.datastacks.com. Perfect. I love it. Uh, and, you know, Everyone's – so please describe uh, – Donna, so starting with you, please describe the details of the survey. When was it conducted and who were the respondents and how many respondents, which is certainly written in, within the paper itself as well. Oh, it certainly was, and I don't have that offhand. I think it was it was in the hall. It was 250 or 300 folks across most of well, all all continents, but Antarctica, <laughs> across Europe, Asia, Africa, and North America. And it was, I think, released in September. And correct me if I'm wrong, Shannon. We launched it, I think, in May or June, and then kind of did the analysis over the summer. Correct. So, yeah. Yeah. We. Yeah, the survey went out, to, yeah, correct, in May, and then we launched the paper in September, correct, yep. Um, yeah, and it, you're right, it did went, it go to about that many, or we had that many survey takers in across the globe. So, It yeah. might be helpful if the, the person that gets the paper itself, we also kind of break that down by, you know, what role in the organization and what kind of industry. So it's a pretty broad mix across. It isn't just financial services or just consulting. It's kind of a, it, we were kind of pleased that it was a, Fairly representative survey of a lot of different organizations. Yeah, agreed. 
Yes. Um, and if you have questions, again, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, everyone's pretty quiet. There's been lots of chats going on, but not a lot of questions. Everyone's enjoying holiday food already, I think. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know I haven't. <laughs> I actually left time for questions this time, which is rare for me. I'm like, you need time for questions. I know you up. usually go over. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's been a lot of comments in here, too, about data quality and, and integrating data quality and building it into there. So, you know, that has always – that was certainly a hot point within the presentation. Um, uh, any additional comments on that from either you or from Louise, too? That, uh, I'd love to hear from you on, on your take on that in general. I will let Louise first, and then I, I will certainly chime in. Louise, did you want to chat on that? Um, it definitely comes up with our customers all the time, um, and that's one of the reasons we decided to base our database on Cassandra because it can support, you know, data from so many different sources. So you're not trying to consolidate it yourself. The database does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, it's also why we've, you know, gone ahead and integrated technologies like the graph database. I think Donna, you mentioned that is one of the you know, big technologies people are considering in the next two years or so. Um, and we're certainly seeing a lot of that as well as people are getting more and more insights be, by being able to correlate um, a lot of that previously unrelatable data. Um, so there's a, a tremendous amount of um, content from that standpoint, but it's only as good as the quality of your data, right? It's really important to make sure that technology you're running on is extremely reliable, that you're replicating the data, when, you know, it's accurate as a result of that. So a lot, definitely a lot of different considerations when it comes to data quality for sure. Yeah, no, and, I, and I'm. I'm sorry. I was just asking if you had anything to add. I think I've got a little bit of a lag on my end. Oh yeah, I think there was. Sorry about that. But yeah, I mean, I think that also shows a little kudos to the data diversity crowd. Is that you know we're kind of the, the the folks that get this even more than others. But I think across the board, both the survey respondents. Um, and obviously the chat. I think that's becoming more and more obvious. And and to me, it's heartening that. Maybe because I've come from tool vendor backgrounds, I get a little trigger when everyone's only talking about the technology, right? And that's only a piece of it. But I think it partly because so many more business people are involved now. To them, that's obvious. You know, I need to have my report right. I don't care that it's on Hadoop or versus, you know, SQL Server. I just want the data right. Um, and so that's sort of a, an extra thing for them, even though it's fun for us. And so I, I just think that's part of the maturity of the industry. Now that data, you know, I know as corny as it is, data is an asset. Uh, and most folks are realizing that it has to be right. And so I think as we get more of those stakeholders involved, like we saw that chart earlier, um, I, I think, you know, it takes a village to raise data, and I think people are kind of coming to that. So I, I'm, I'm seeing that, that more and more people are starting with things like governance and data quality before they implement a thing, which I think is great, because that, that's what stays. Your technology is going to come and go, and it's great, uh, but it's the people in the process, and the data, the data itself stays across systems. So, you know, I, I thought that was heartening. I, I want yeah, to add one other thing. Next, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to move on to the oh. next question. So if you have a. Oh, and it was a question, but I saw some of the comments that people were surprised by the number of logical and conceptual data models. So, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think some of the comments are like, who are these people? Who's actually doing that? I see that all the time. Um, and I may be biased because we use them in our practice, especially conceptual, because I. I almost consider that sort of the whiteboard version of your data model. I know they can be hard and they can take a long time, but they can also kind of be fairly easy to sketch up and, and do some very critical uh, analysis very quickly. And I see that as attributed to more and more business people being involved. It seems to me, and I know I'm stereotyping, often it's the tech folks that don't like to do them. I just want to build the stuff and, okay, I'll begrudgingly reverse engineer a physical model, but just let me code. Um, but business people love them because it's that kind of way to demystify what's in the database and, and really start hashing out the business rules. So I see that paralleled with with kind of that rise in, in business users becoming more involved because it's a great way to get them involved is, is using a conceptual or logical model. Pedestal, I have removed myself from the pedestal. I'll stop talking about that. <laughs> I had to get those two cents in. <laughs> we have just lost a minute left, but I know you have an elevator pitch for this, Donna, and Louise, feel free to jump in. So um, is there a business case for data management? We get this question a lot, so I, I know this person is not the only one asking about this. Business case for data management, any good resources? 
Nah. <laughs> Just surprise <laughs> you. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I think the business case for case management really depends on your company. So, of course, there's a business uh, case. This paper sort of hits on it. I talk about a lot. A lot of the previous webinars you'll see kind of talk about data strategy and a lot of your business needs. But that's something I think you have to, of course, if you don't do it right, you have to do it again. Um, but I think aligning that to your company's kind of goals is the best way to answer that. It's not necessarily reading a, a book or even going to the DM box or DMA or anything like that. It's kind of tying it back to your company. That's what I would say. Wait, is there anything you want to add? No, I, I think that's that's pretty much accurate from what from our standpoint as well. It's very much based on the company. It's based on the type of workloads that you're dealing with. Um, and again, I think that goes back to we actually use we actually use whiteboarding for these kind of discussions as well. Is actually figuring out. You know, all the different parts of the business that the data strategy is going to impact, and that's we find a good place to start, right? Oftentimes, as a vendor, we're approaching one part of the business when, in fact, you know, it's a data strategy that can impact the more than one part of the organization. Well, Luis, it's been such a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to Data Stacks for sponsoring today uh, and helping make these webinars happen. And Donna, thank you, as always, for a great presentation. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and all the great comments and questions, but that is all the time we have for today. Uh, just a reminder again, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and the recording. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.